burnt my lips and clay that my words may not just be my words, that we all may be inspired by your holy scripture. Amen. Well, because we've got a wedding today, um, I decided that I'd probably better keep the sermon a little shorter than normal. Um, yeah, you see, it's deathly quiet. <laughs> oh, don't do that! Oh, dear, oh, dear. Honestly. Um, yeah, well, that's fallen flat, I should say it again, and see whether I get a better response, but no, I don't risk that. <laughs> so I'm going to keep it a little shorter. Now, for the last few weeks, I've been concentrating on the Eucharistic vision of Christ, and today's Gospel was very strong on that. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Uh, and in fact, uh, our um, sermon hymn is Bread of Heaven, wonderful, uh, to a Welsh hymn tune. It's a beautiful hymn, I love it. But actually, uh, my sympathies today are with Elijah. Um, and I was having a conversation with somebody I used to mention a lot in service, David Stankovich, who's a young friend of mine when he's not as young as he was. He's getting on for 30 now. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was a teenager when I was um, at uh, the church where he was at. And he's gone through this amazing transformation. You know, there's many people who talk about bettering themselves and wanting a better life, and nothing happens. Well, David, from a very, very ordinary background, and he was adopted by a, a woman of extraordinary kindness, who adopted people of all ages, left, right, and center. Um, he was a little Irish lady, and her house would be full of people whom she had adopted, who may be uh, fully grown people who needed somewhere um, to be cared for and nurtured, and she she loved them. She was a, a ferocious lady, but you have to be if you're going to do kindness properly. You have to be able to do kindness even at the risk of someone's immediate comfort. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I've watched David transform himself until he's now doing a master's in theology, um, and he's just an extraordinary man. Actually, he's an extraordinary man. Um, he has a hunger for knowledge and for the truth, uh, which you seldom see. But he was talking to me about the idea of brokenness, uh, of broken humanity, of himself feeling like he was broken. And I said, no, 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 I think, I think you've got the wrong end of the sick. I think what most of us see as brokenness is actually um, <coughs> our design parameters that we as human beings frequently mix apples and oranges, uh, that we feel uh, mortified because the Ford we've just bought isn't a trans-dimensional light-speed supercar. And because it doesn't do what a trans-dimensional light-speed supercar does, we think it's inadequate, when actually it's a really good car. It just won't take you to different dimensions or zip you to the other end of the galaxy. And frequently, human beings, uh, we, we contrast ourselves with the actions of Almighty God, uh, with the vastness of creation and the perfection that we glimpse in the vision glorious, when those of us who have had uh, a mystical experience glimpse Almighty God, and all of a sudden we wonder why we are not that. Instead of recognizing that we are, but just not all of that. That we are part of that. That we are part of the totality, grandeur, and wonder of Almighty God. But we are a human part. And therefore, we are generally expected, I believe, by Almighty God, to behave like human beings. Which means that we are expected to function within our design parameters. Mm -hmm. Now, our design parameters include all manner of things which we, at this moment in our social development, find inconvenient. But God clearly thought that they were appropriate because they're there. So human beings have bodies which can be messy, they can be urgent, uh, they can be insisting, they can have appetites, they can be embarrassing, they might not look like how we particularly like them to look because we've been uh, formed by our current society to have very clear ideas of what is beautiful and what is not beautiful. But we must remember that's all on us. That's a fantasy that we've created in the here and now. It's nothing whatsoever to do with God. It's all part of our design parameters as human beings. 
the squalls and the grizzles that we have are the ways in which we try and accommodate the unreasonable demands of ourselves and other people, none of whom seem to be content to be a human being, all of whom want to be something which is imposed on them from without and certainly not imposed on them by God. The church has been guilty of this, the media of course is guilty of this, but remember, the media only produces something that people want to consume. <laughs> you know, we're all guilty from that one. Um, the whole of our society buys into this concept that we must be something other than what we are. Now, bettering yourself doesn't mean fundamentally changing your design parameters. It means being fully human in the specific instance of whoever you may be. <clears throat> fully Clinton, fully Marty, fully Carol, even fully wrong. <laughs> Although we better keep some sort of handle on that, or the police will come involved. But uh, being fully ourselves, and that doesn't mean you stay exactly as you are. No, 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 it doesn't. It means that you enter onto a quest in fully outworking and realizing that Clintonness, that Rodneyness, that Jimness. Difficult way of describing things because. Uh, it means that we have to fundamentally make peace with God's uh, joy and design in our creation as opposed to what everyone else is telling us. Now poor old Elijah was in that same position that he believed that he had to be the representative of human development. That because he had glimpsed God and spoken to God, therefore the human was insufficient. And he said, I'm no better than my ancestors, better than I just lie down and die. And I, I have felt that myself. I'm no better than those who went before. Well, why should I be? I am made of the same flesh and blood. And those that went before are frequently the ones that inspired me in the first place. I'm no better than my ancestors. Well, wonderful. That means you're no worse than your ancestors, either. <laughs> Probably means that you're a human being. And it might mean that your ancestors were also human beings. Uh -huh. I'm no better than my ancestors. Well, thankfully the angel, and of course angel means messenger of God, did not take Elijah's despair. And it was a strange sort of despair when you think about it. It was a sort of grandiose, ego-driven despair. He was disappointed that he hadn't made more of himself than those who had gone before. But within that is a call to humility. And the call to humility is that Elijah should not have been in the business of building himself up to be a greater thing than the individuals that went before him. He should have been in the business of being fully Elijah. Because Elijah had the privilege of this extraordinary call from God upon his life. And that call didn't end with his despair. <laughs> Thankfully, we are not allowed to wallow in our despair. The angel of the Lord came down and prodded him. You can imagine the, the messenger of God giving him a narrow kick a couple of times, you know. <laughs> Shove him and say, look, 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 food for goodness sakes. <laughs> food for the journey. When we anoint somebody in death, when they're approaching the time of death, we give them the whey bread. We give them the viaticum, the food for the journey. We receive food on a very basic level all the time. Huge quantities of it, if yesterday's were to go by. <laughs> oh, dear, dear. Oh, <sighs> the triple legged cake went pretty damn quickly. But you know, there was some flan left. It didn't last. <laughs> Mardi and I thought that it was a disgrace to have that left in the refrigerator, so we polished it off. <laughs> what was I saying? <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, the food for the journey, that was it. <laughs> Jesus is the bread of life, which means a very special sort of food for the journey. The sort of food that he talked about frequently when on earth, the sort of food that nourishes and sustains and will never pull, will never cloy, or will never cease to nourish, that once eaten continues the work of building up the body of the soul. It is not a passing or a transitory food. It doesn't run out. It doesn't 
waste away. It's not like eating bread whereby come the evening you are hungry again. It's a sort of bread that once you taste it, you are never hungry again. Because once tasted it, you are always tasted. Once it touches your tongue, it's like the live coal that was placed upon the tongue of Ezekiel when he was asked to prophesy. It changed how he, as a human being, reacted to God. He remained a human being, but he became a vehicle for prophecy. When we are touched by that living bread, we become something a little more than just our sweating selves. We become fully the vision of Almighty God.